polysaccharides contain multiple monosaccharides linked through glycosidic linkages. And we can think of polysaccharides as polyacetal since the anomeric carbon involved in the glycosidic linkage is part of an acetal functional group. So here I've highlighted in green one example of a glycosidic linkage within a hypothetical polysaccharide. And we represent polysaccharides a number of different ways. So we can use this flat hexagonal representation of the monosaccharide unit with wedges and dashes to show the positions of the hydroxyls. You'll also often see chair forms drawn like this. And in this drawing, we find the glycosidic linkage right here. And you'll sometimes also see this stylistic representation of polysaccharides just with a hexagon for every monosaccharide unit. So no stereochemistry, no atoms really even are drawn, and the glycosidic linkage is implied by these lines between the hexagons. As we did for disaccharides, we can number the glycosidic linkages in polysaccharides, and the assumption is that the glycosidic linkages are uniform throughout the length of the polymer. In biochemical contexts, the polymerization of monosaccharides is strictly controlled so that specific types of polysaccharides correspond to a single type of glycosidic linkage. For example, here we see that in the blue sugar, carbon-1 is involved, the anomeric carbon, and in the red sugar, carbon-3 is involved, and in fact it's the same in this representation. This is just a different view of the same polysaccharide with carbons 1 and 3 linked through the glycosidic oxygen, we might say. This is a 1-3 glycosidic linkage. In naming polysaccharides, we're also often interested in the stereochemistry or configuration of the anomeric carbon involved in the glycosidic linkage. Actually, in this flat hexagonal drawing, the configuration is not specified, but it is in the chair form, and this turns out to be the alpha configuration of the glucose unit, the alpha anomer, if you will. And so to fully describe the glycosidic linkage, with both connectivity and stereochemical information, we can say it's an alpha-1,3 polysaccharide, or an alpha-1,3 glycosidic linkage. We distinguish between polysaccharides, which are also called glycans, using differences in the connectivity and stereochemistry of their glycosidic linkages. In addition to the identity of the monosaccharides involved, D-glucose monomers in biochemical contexts are by far the most common, and there's plenty to know just thinking about D-glucose monomers, since there is a very large variety of stereochemical configurations and connectivities that can show up in potential polysaccharides, even with just D-glucose monomers. Amylose is one of the most important polysaccharides. It's a polymer of D-glucose with alpha-1,4 linkages. So let's ver verify that here really quickly. We see that the anomeric hydroxyl or the anomeric oxygen, if you will, of the glucose unit has uh, the oxygen in an axial position. That suggests the alpha configuration. And it's a 1,4 linkage. Here, carbon 1 of this monomer unit is involved, and carbon 4 of the next monomer unit is involved. And we can verify that by starting at carbon 1 and numbering around away from the oxygen like this. So amylose consists of an alpha 1,4 linkage. And this connectivity gives rise to a helical sh shape for the polysaccharide when you kind of zoom out and look at it from a broader view. Because of its he helical shape, it's relatively difficult to digest. It's a component of starch and one that is difficult for enzymes to bite into to release the monosaccharide units. But when that hydrolysis occurs to give the monomer units, we get glucose and this is an input to glycolysis, which is an energy-producing pathway for cells. Amylopectin is similar to amylose in that it has alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkages along these linear chains that you see. But it also contains alpha-1,6 linkages at certain branch points. And amylopectin is much more highly branched than amylose. In fact, amylose is just linear. Amylopectin is highly branched. Because of its branching and the fact that the monomer units can pack close together, the density of glucose units in amylopectin is larger than it is in amylose. And so in a sense, amylopectin is packing more energy into a smaller space thanks to its branching. Amylopectin is found in plant starch, but there's an animal equivalent, and that's glycogen. Glycogen is similar to amylopectin, but contains more frequent branches. Again, packing even more energy density into the same volume by including more branches along the chain. And just as in amylopectin, these branches 
are alpha-1,6 glycosidic linkages. And so you have a branching sugar which has monosaccharide units connected to it at both carbons 4 and 6 at these branch points. When the anomeric carbon involved in the glycosidic bond has the beta configuration, we're looking at an entirely different class of polysaccharides called beta-glucans. This is a group of polymers of D-glucose with the beta configuration of the anomeric carbon. So the example shown here, for instance, is a 1,4 polysaccharide with a 1,4 glycosidic linkage, and the equatorial oxygen connected to this anomeric carbon suggests the beta anomer is involved, or the beta configuration of the anomeric carbon is involved. Cellulose is the most famous example of a beta-glucan. And these are very, very difficult to digest, even more difficult than the alpha polysaccharides, in large part due to the equatorial position of this oxygen and the greater stability as a result. Beta-glucans are an important component of dietary fiber, which you may know just from popular science is very, very difficult for our bodies to digest and in some cases impossible.